Good to see you guys. Thanks for being with us today across our different locations. Those of you joining us online, thank you. You know, uh, we have a statement that we throw around a lot just in culture. We say seeing is what? Believing. Believing. You got to see it to believe it. I learned this pretty early on in parenting. I remember when my daughter was three and she could do no wrong. And at one point, Lori and I saw that she had been playing with some toys. And when she walked away, there were some candy wrappers that were empty over by where the toys were. And I'm like, well, you know, we both knew there, were no, there was no candy in the house that she could access. Like, so we're, we're, we're like, Emma, where did you get the candy? And, and she says, I don't know. <laughs> and then she just kind of goes on. Oh, okay, you know, she's my sweet little angel. If she doesn't know, then she doesn't know. Then a little later, I remember one time I went and I was getting her up in the morning and I'm like, what's this? And there was like Hershey Kiss wrappers in her bed that she had obviously eaten before she went to sleep after we, I said, Emma, where, where did you get this candy? Where the, she says, I don't know. And this went on for a while until finally I went into the closet. I don't know if you're a parent with young kids, you have a space like this. We just called it the closet. And it was the closet where you kicked and threw and put all the toys. You know what I'm talking about? You just, you don't go in there unless you have to. Living things could be alive in the closet, right? You know, so I open it up, I go in, I'm like, oh man. And I go all the way back, I was looking for something. And all of a sudden I get to the back of the toy closet and there is a whole stash of candy that my sweet, innocent little three-year-old girl snagged from like Halloween or something and then took it back. She didn't know where she got it, but she had a little stash where she could get back to it. And I learned then that even as a parent, you can trust, but you must verify, right? Hey, did you brush your teeth? Oh, yeah, 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 Dad, I brushed my teeth. Right. And then you go over and what? You check the toothbrush, right? See, is it wet? Did you brush your teeth? Did you, did you wash your hair? Oh, yeah, I washed my hair in the shower. No problem. You're like, did you use shampoo? Yeah, I use shampoo. But listen, you still got to verify. Any, any parent of a young boy knows you better verify. You got to do the smell test, you know. Come here. Smell like wet dog, <laughs> right? You got to verify things. And, we, and that's a very wise way that we kind of live our lives. There are certain things you don't want to purchase until you can see it and inspect it, right? Um, you know, you might have a sports team that you love, but, but you don't want to start declaring they're going to the Super Bowl. Let your heart really go there until they actually rack up some victory. You got to see it in order to believe it. And this can have a lot of wisdom in our lives. But when it comes to our faith, it can get really challenging. And it's easy to believe when things are going well in your life. But what do you do when things are really hard? You know, what, what do you do when uh, you're praying that, that God will do a miracle in your marriage and the marriage continues to struggle? When, when you know, you pray that God will bring the right person into your life and, and the months go by and the years go by and that person hasn't shown up yet? What do, what do you do when you have physical pain and you ask God to heal that pain and you believe he'll heal that pain and you go to church and you claim your miracle and then, you know, like the next day you wake up and it still hurts? It can get hard to believe in God when it seems like he's missing. And it can be challenging when you look around and you don't see him moving and working in your life. But I want to encourage you today. We're in a series called Hopeful. Why the best is still to come. And I think one of the greatest things that we can take hope in from scripture is this. No matter what is going on in our life, God is always moving and working. Listen, God is still moving even when it feels like he's missing. And so if you're here today and you're going through some stuff in your life, maybe you're even confused and not sure where God is in all of it. I want you to know that no matter how you feel, God is still moving and he's working. And we're going to unpack some things today from the Bible that I think can bring a lot of hope and encouragement to you in your personal situation. And to do that, I want to look at an Old Testament story, uh, the story of Esther. It's a whole book in the Old Testament of your Bible. It is so rich. And Esther's unique in a couple ways. Um, first of all, it's this amazing story with like heroes and villains and murder and you know all this stuff. And then ultimately the bad guy really gets it in the end. 
The second thing about Esther is this. It's the only book in the Bible that never mentions the name of God. And I think the author probably did this intentionally. Because sometimes you can look at a circumstance or a situation or what's going on in a country or what's happening on a national platform and feel like God isn't moving and working at all. But just because God's name isn't on every page, what you see in the book of Esther is God was actually moving and working through every situation. And in Esther, he's just not named, but he's working. And so I want to talk to you today about how we can have hope because God is still moving. And here's some ways that God moves in our lives. First of all, God moves through unlikely people. God moves through unlikely people. Uh, You probably won't want to admit this in church, but I'll ask you. uh, It's central, so you might. Um, Are anybody like fans of The Bachelor? Anybody anybody watch The Bachelor? Okay, you know, like this is serious business with some of the ladies, right? Like, Like they're not messing around. When it comes to The Bachelor, I don't know if you know this, but, but there are actually brackets at the beginning of a new Bachelor season, and ladies get together, and, and it's like the final four with sports, right? You got to pick who you think is going to ultimately connect with The Bachelor at the end of the show, and so you, they actually like, like frame out all, the, all these um, different ladies' names and who's going to win, who's going to accept the rose at the end. It's a thing. I don't understand it. I'm just reporting back from the front lines, y'all. Well, the book of Esther is kind of like an ancient version of The Bachelor, okay? Except in Esther, the person that wins The Bachelor ultimately gets to marry the king. So Israel at the time Esther was written was um, ruled by King Xerxes. And uh, he was a non-Jewish king who ruled over uh, that area of the Jewish people. And King Xerxes had had a 187-day party to celebrate how awesome he was. I mean, come on, y'all. We think we do it big. Like, we think people think, oh, man, they do it crazy in Vegas. 187 straight days. And at the end, everybody's a little like tipsy and had too much to drink for the 18,000th time, right? And and so the king and all these guys are sitting around and he says, somebody go get the queen and bring her out so we can admire her beauty. And so they send for the queen and the queen's like, I'm not doing it. (laughs) She's like, I am not gonna be paraded out there in front of a bunch of drunk men again for my beauty, right? She's like, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it. And this throws the king into such a rage that he says, basically, long story short, he says, we're, we're gonna have a contest and we're gonna collect all the beautiful, eligible women from the whole land and we're gonna put them in this massive bachelor beauty contest and I'm gonna pick a new queen. And so he goes through the whole thing and this is where we meet this woman named Esther. She is a Jewish person. Um, she shows up on the scene. The Bible says she's, she's beautiful, she's lovely. And ultimately, when the king sees her, he's enthralled. We see this in Esther chapter 2, beginning in verse 17. Help me out on the red word. Say it real loud when we get down there to it. It says, and the king loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her what? Queen, So she becomes the queen instead of Vashti. Esther is now the queen. Now, here's what I want you to understand. When you read through the first two chapters of Esther, almost everybody agrees Esther is a complete failure. I mean, truly. Like, like women read this and they're like, so Vashti is the only woman who showed spine. And she's demoted. And Esther, who just is all about her looks and her beauty, there's no mention about her character, about anything else about her, right? Esther rolls up on the scene, and she's just totally compliant. She just rolls over. She just does everything everybody wants her to do. She does what the beauty officers tells her to do. She jumps through all the workout kinds of things. She does all the things to look beautiful and all this. She presents herself to the king. And then it gets a little, it gets a little dicey here because most scholars will tell you, like, like, in the midst of this beauty pageant, there was a little more going on, like the king slept with these ladies before he married them. 
So now you got Esther like sleeping with somebody and they're not married and then she's a Jewish person and she's marrying outside of her faith and her religion and then on top of all that there's a lot of partying and a lot of alcohol and a lot of non-kosher foods. Jewish people historically have really struggled with the book of Esther. And almost everybody reads through the first two chapters, whether you're progressive or super traditional, and you're like, she's a mess, man. Why is she the key of this story? And I think that's part of the point. Look, she makes mistakes. She did things that we may look at her and think disqualify her. Right? She, she wasn't perfect. She didn't, you know, she wasn't like, like f- jumping through every sort of religious and moral hoop and doing all the right things. But God loves to work through unlikely people. God loves to use people others have written off, others think could never be used, others think could never make an impact. And what we're going to see in Esther's story is this. How you started is not as important as how you finish. Esther will become a hero in the story. Esther will show tremendous faith and risk her life for the people of God. But at this point in the story, you don't really see that. And somebody needs to hear this today. God uses imperfect people for his perfect plans. God can use you no matter how much you've messed up, no matter how disqualified you feel, no matter how sidetracked you got, no matter how selfish you may have become, no matter how much you've been hurt or no matter how much you've squandered things, no matter how many times you've refused in the past, no matter how skeptical you've become, no matter how scared you are, no matter how messy things have gotten, listen, he has given you gifts, he's given you abilities, he's given you influence, he's given you life experiences, he's given you knowledge, and he has plans, he wants you to to play a part, even though you may be the most unlikely person in the messy situation. That's the goodness of God. Life is not about how you started. It's about how you finished, and God can empower you to finish like a hero. Somebody somewhere is praying that God will move, and maybe today God wants to move through you. Maybe you're the one that he wants to work through. He doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. So if you feel unqualified, God can use you. If you feel like you have a past, God can use you. If you don't seem to fit in, God can use you. God is moving even when it feels like he's missing, and he is often moving through unlikely people. Another thing we see in the story of Esther is that God moves through scary situations. God moves through some scary situations. So Esther becomes the queen. Awesome. Except, and you would think maybe that's the end of the fairy tale story. Rags to riches. Nobody to somebody. This unknown Jewish girl who's now like queen of the whole kingdom. But what you find is this new character emerges in the story of Esther, a dude named Haman. And Haman is an evil guy. In fact, someday I'm going to do a message on Haman because it's got to be the greatest story of the danger of pride in somebody's life in the Bible. I mean, Haman's kind of a mess. He gets a pointed to the number two person in the entire kingdom. So he's got power, he's got influence, right? He's got all the things. And then Haman kind of orchestrates it where the king signs into law this uh, provision where everybody has to bow to Haman when they see him. And he's loving it, man. Can you imagine that? Like you walk out, you know, somebody at your apartment complex, they're like, <laughs> like, that's right. Just bow, people. I used to get everybody in the car. This is a fun thing to do. And, and uh, I'd be driving along and just tap the brakes. I'd say, everybody bow. Boom. <laughs> bow to Judd. Boom. Bow to Judd. Boom. Just, you're welcome. My kids loved it. My wife didn't love that so much. But Haman loves that people bow down to him and show him respect everywhere he goes, except there's this one Guy, Mordecai, he's nothing. He's nobody. He's just a, just a guy. But he sees him regularly when he walks by this, this, this gate area. And when he walks past, Mordecai does not bow to him. And we find out Mordecai ultimately doesn't bow because 
um, Haman's people, the Canaanites, have a long, violent history with his people. He was Jewish, the Israelites, and he's like, we're not doing it. But this just infuriates Haman. It gets under his skin. I mean, he's got all the power in the world. He's the second most powerful person in the whole kingdom. He's got everything, right? Money, privilege, everywhere he goes, somebody. But there's this one nobody that doesn't bow to him, and he can't live with it. It keeps him up at night. It bothers him. He's, he starts obsessing about it. He says, I'm going to find out who this guy is. He says, finds out Mordecai. He's, he's a Jew. And so he basically decides, not only does Mordecai need to die, but all the Jewish people need to die. Let's kill them all. And so he orchestrates and plots to kill not only Mordecai, but, but the Jewish people. And he basically gets the king to sign a decree that says on a certain date, basically it's free reign on the Jewish people. You can kill them, you can plunder, you can take what they have, and they can't fight back. So Haman's feeling pretty good about himself. He's like, take that, Mordecai. I'm going to take you out. I'm going to take your whole race out because you wouldn't bow. Some of you might be in a situation where you, you feel a little defenseless right now. You ever been in a place where you just feel like your back's against the wall? You got an employer who's out for you? You know what I'm talking about? Right? You got, you got somebody you feel like there's like a target on your back? Some of you are in a place where you feel like, man, right now in my life, I, uh, I, my ex is making my life uh, uh, difficult and hard and saying all kinds of lies about me. And you just, you don't, you feel defenseless, you know? Some of you are in a place where, uh, you know, with a family member, you feel defenseless. Or, or with an insurance situation, you feel defenseless. We all know what it is to feel defenseless, but here's my encouragement. God is already working to solve the problem before it became a problem. That's what we see in the book of Esther. He's already moving. He's going ahead of you. Just because you can't see God moving right now doesn't mean he's not moving. Just because you're not aware of what God is doing, that doesn't mean God isn't working. God loves to move and work through unlikely people in scary situations, and he shows up. And that's what he started doing, as we see in the book of Esther. There are two things that Haman didn't discover about this guy, Mordecai, the non-bower. Number one, he didn't realize that a few months earlier... Mordecai had been at the right place at the right time, and he had literally spoiled an assassination attempt on the king's life. So he's in good with the king. Number two, Haman didn't know that Esther was Mordecai's adopted daughter. <laughs> it's about to get hot up in here. <laughs> but you see how God had already gone ahead of the problem? And even though it wouldn't be obvious necessarily in the moment, and it's not always obvious to us, take courage and take heart. God has gone ahead of you in your problems. When that problem rocks up in your life, it's not like God was totally unaware that it would ever rock up in your life. God has already done work in your life beside you, in front of you, behind you. He's preparing and he is making a way for you. And so... All of this stuff I don't think is lost on Mordecai, and so here's what he does in the story. He, uh, he goes to Esther, and he basically pleads with her to use her position and her influence as queen to reverse this law and to save the Jewish people. And he says in this famous line, Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, this is Mordecai speaking to Esther. He says, who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a what? Time as this. He's like, you know, Esther, maybe all this went down and, and you can debate about how it went down and how wrong or not, you know, it might have been or whatever, but maybe you're here now for such a time as this. And we see it all over the Bible. God raises up people before the enemy raises up problems. Maybe God raised you up for such a time as this. Has anybody thought over the last 20 months, like, why, God? Why am I alive right now? Could, why couldn't I live pre-pandemic or post-pandemic, whenever that is? 
right? Like, why, why am I having to walk through this situation right now? Am I, why am I having to face this stuff in my life? I mean, sometimes we look around our life and we say, why me? But listen, God may have raised you up for such a time as this. He may have raised you up to be a solution. He may have gifted you and empowered you to be a light in a dark place, to show love in a hard place, to bring peace to chaos. I know some of you, you're facing challenges. You're raising a challenging child right now. Maybe has learning issues or behavioral issues, and it's so hard. But listen, God knew that this child would need a parent just like you. And God gave you that child. And he also gave that child you. He went ahead of you in the situation. Somebody struggling with, with uh, chronic health issues or somebody you love is struggling with chronic health issues and it's so hard and it's heartbreaking to care for them and you not only, maybe you feel sorry for them but you also feel sorry for yourself and you feel guilty, you feel overwhelmed but God knew they would need someone like you. Maybe that situation at work is unfair, it's unjust, you, you can't see clearly right now what's going on, you wonder why God ever brought you to this place. You pray for a way out, but maybe God knew the situation would need someone just like you to make a difference. God loves to flip obstacles into opportunities. He loves to use people, people of courage and faith who will step up and who will say, I will act at such a time as this. And so it might be unlikely. You may be unlikely. I'm unlikely. But God uses unlikely people in all kinds of situations and in scary situations. I mean, I think about just this last season and, and all that everybody's been through. There, there could be a temptation right now in some people's lives to sort of pull back, just to close the blinds, protect your own, circle the wagons, just take care of your business and don't really worry about anybody else. And certainly we as a people of faith, as a church community, we could pull back and just circle the wagons and protect our own. But that's just not our way. Maybe we're here for such a time as this. Maybe we're here precisely to press forward and to be the light in the darkness for people. I mean, it's part of what our Hope for Kids initiative is about every year, pushing forward to bless tens of thousands of kids and families, being a light in a difficult time. And I want to suggest to you that God has made us as the church community for such a time as this. It's not time to pull back. It's time to step up. It's time to take some risks. It's time to serve. It's time to give generously. It's time to invite. It's time to grow. It's time to share the hope that we have with the people who need it. God can turn a pandemic into a revival. Who believes that? He can turn a pandemic into a revival. He can turn a fearful heart into a peace-filled heart. He can turn uncertainty and fill it with hope for the future. He can flip division and prejudice and turn it into unity and love. He can take a breakdown and turn it into a breakthrough. He could take a setback and turn it into a comeback, right? He just needs people who will stand up in the mess and who will say, God, I'm yours and I'm willing to serve you. And maybe I'm here for such a time time as this. And that's what Esther does. In fact, she's talking to Mordecai, and Mordecai's like, you got to do something. You have to go talk to the king. And there was this rule at the time that if you approach the king without being summoned, you could die. He could take your life. You did not approach the king. And Mordecai's like, hey, look, you're here for such a time as this. This has to happen or all these people are going to potentially die. Even you could potentially die when it becomes known you're actually Jewish. You know, like there's all these dynamics. Esther makes this amazing statement. She says, okay, they get a plan. They're going to have the people of Israel, um, the Jewish people, pray for three days and fast. And then she's going to go and meet the king. And she says to Mordecai, and if I die, I die. Look, there comes a place in your life where your faith really meets the road. And where some of you have to look in the mirror and say, come what may, I will serve the Lord. And if I die, I die. And that's where Esther is. So the beauty queen, the flippant bachelorette, 
right? The beautiful side act that everybody can take shots at. Well, what do you say now? Right now she's willing to put it all on the line. And so they pray. They cry out to the God who's never mentioned by name in the book of Esther. God moves in scary situations. Here's the third thought. God moves through unfair favor. He moves through unfair favor. What's amazing about the book of Esther is all of the happy coincidences. Okay, we see them everywhere. As I mentioned earlier, Mordecai just happened to be at the right place and the right time to overhear a plot to kill the king before this ever like brewed up. And so he chose to pass that information on to Esther who passes that information along to the king and it saves his life. And months later, the king just happened to wake up one night and he asks his servant to read him from the official court documents. And this servant just happens to be reading and to share the record of this dude named Mordecai who saved his life. And the king just happens to wonder if they ever did anything to honor this Mordecai guy. And the answer was no. And so the king asked, well, who's available to make this right? Who can honor this person who saved my life? And there was only one person who happened to be available. Guess who it was? It was Haman, the villain Haman. And so the king gives him a job. He says, Haman, this is what you're going to do. And you didn't argue with the king. It wasn't a debate. He says, Haman, you're going you're gonna to basically go out and you're going to lead a parade in honor of this guy, Mordecai, because he saved my life by revealing this plot. And all of this was, I mean, it was very fortunate because Haman just happened to have plotted the murder of Mordecai that very day. So rather than kill his enemy, Haman is now commanded to lead a parade through the city, calling for people to celebrate him. That is what you call the favor of God. You can't buy that. It's not up for sale. But God shows unfair favor. The Bible says God laughs at the schemes of the wicked. God can always outmaneuver those who move against you. And he's the unseen hand working for the good of those who trust him and walk with him. So here's this powerful principle. When you step out in faith, you step into his favor. Esther was stepping out in faith and stepping in to God's favor. And she decides to take a risk and seek out the king, even though it could cost her her life. She gets everything ready. They pray. And then she goes in to see the king. And here's what happens. Esther chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. It says, Then the king asked her, What do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? I will what? Give. I will give it to you, even if it is half the kingdom. God had prepared the way. God had showed his favor. And he says, Look, I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. Sometimes God's favor shows up in our life through the kindness of others. Right, God will predispose people to like you, to welcome you, to give you what you need. And then the reason maybe in your life that that old interview went so well, or maybe the recent interview went so well, it wasn't just because you were awesome, it was God's favor over your life. Uh, look, when that person in power gave you the benefit of the doubt and kept you from facing damaging consequences, it wasn't just about like how sad your situation was, it was God's favor. When you caught that lucky break that made such a difference, it wasn't random. It wasn't the universe smiling on you. The universe doesn't care. It was God's favor, right? When you landed that deal, made that sale, caught that error that saved the company's reputation, it wasn't just your skill, it was God's favor. Some of you right now, you're, you're good with money, you're good with finances, things are good, they're stable in your life. But it, look, it's not just that you're a financial genius, it's God's favor in your life. You gotta recognize it for what it is. We all know smart people, talented people, deserving people, honest people who have things that don't go their way. But God's favor opens doors. 
God's favor softens heart. God's favor brings honor. His favor brings abundance. It overcomes opposition. It outmaneuvers every obstacle. Listen, God's favor, it increases your influence. It secures your success. It elevates you beyond your expertise. It places you in a position despite your, your performance. And God's favor is not fair. It is not fair. It's not about your past. It is about God's plans. It's not about what you deserve. It's about what God needs you to do so you can step out in faith and step into his favor. You can pray that God will show up to do more than you can imagine, even though you may not see him working right now in your life. And so Esther goes in in this moment. And the king says, I'll, I'll give you whatever you want. And she blows the whistle on Haman at just the right time. And the king, when he hears Haman's schemed against Esther, because she's half Jewish and, and this whole nation of people and that the king's been manipulated and used, he gets enraged and he basically says, he basically has Haman impaled on a post that Haman had built to put Mordecai on. Game over. And then the king takes all of Haman's possessions and gives them to Esther. And then he goes, you know, this guy not only was faithful, Mordecai, he saved my life already through an assassination attempt. And the way he's managed this situation, he raises Mordecai up to take Haman's place as his number two in the kingdom. And I say all this because just because God's name isn't mentioned on every page, you can see his hand working in every way. But there were times in Esther when the story didn't look like it was going to be a happy ending. Some of you are there right now. You're at a time in the story where God feels like he's missing and, and you don't know where to go or where to turn. It doesn't feel like it's going to be a happy ending. But Jesus said this, not that seeing is believing. Jesus said, blessed are those who believe even though they've never seen me. You got to believe in the uncertainty. And you got to look at who God is and at how he moves and works through unlikely people and unlikely circumstances and unlikely situations. See, with God, you can believe even when you don't see. You can believe he hears you even when you don't yet hear an answer. You can believe he provides for you even when your resources are tight. You can believe that he's guiding you even when you can't see a way out. You can believe he cares for you even when you're carrying so much. You can believe he's fighting for you even when you feel defenseless. You can believe he loves you even when you feel unappreciated. Look, you can believe he has plans for you even though you may feel feel trapped. You can believe that he is with you, even though you may feel alone. You can believe he forgives you, even though you can't forgive yourself. You can believe that he's working, even when you can't see it. Because God moves through unlikely people and scary situations, and his favor isn't fair. And my prayer for all of us today is that we would have a sense of God's favor over our lives. A favor that we don't deserve. A favor, look, you didn't get where you are because you're so great, even though you're great. You got here by the grace of God the same way I did. And it's only the favor of God that will see us through and walk us through the valleys and the mountains ahead of us in our lives. Believe that he's working, even if it's scary right now. Believe that he's working, even if you can't quite see it right now. And hold on to hope, because he is a God who moves. And he moves through all kinds of situations. He's always working. Maybe for some of you, you know he's been working in your heart and life. Even for you to hear my voice today. Maybe he's brought you to this place and he's tapping you on the shoulder. He's calling you to come home to him, to return to him, to surrender to him. I want to give you an opportunity to name Jesus the leader and the forgiver of your life today. So I'm going to ask all of you, would you bow your heads and close your, close your eyes? If you'd like to become a follower of Jesus today, you can begin that journey. 
You can just repeat this simple prayer after me, either out loud or in your own heart and mind. This isn't the end of your journey, it's it's the beginning. It's just a way to open your heart to God. Just say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. Friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. Just slip your hand in the air and acknowledge you're going to follow God. You're going to trust him in your life today. You're going to surrender to him. He's already been moving in your life. He's already been working, and he will continue to. Slip your hand in the air. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for each person reaching out to you today, and we pray you'll fill them with peace and joy. May they just experience the power of your spirit working and moving in their life. May they be empowered to walk in faith every day. And God, will you fill all of us with your hope today in a powerful way. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's put our hands together for those who made spiritual commitments in their life today. If you prayed that prayer with me, if you made a spiritual commitment, I want to tell you congratulations. Uh, We would love to serve you and connect with you. We'd love to know how we can pray for you. We'd also love to send you some free resources. If you'll just go to central.family, just click the the link, I have decided to follow Jesus. Let us know, know you made that spiritual commitment, and we'll make sure to get in touch with you and see how we can help you and serve you.